Davis on 4. You're tuned to 4FM. You're listening to Davis on 4. Derek Davis here with a very special guest. I was just saying to him earlier on, he's someone that we all feel that we know because, not to put a tooth in it, he's been around a long time. He's produced some wonderful songs. And we always think of him as one of our own, even though most of his work really has been abroad. I learned two shocking things about you, Gilbert O'Sullivan. (laughs) Two shocking things. One, you're actually older than I am. And the other shocking thing is you look 20 years younger. (laughs) Uh, Is that because of a background in kind of boxing training and athleticism, or is it clean living? How do you do it, Peter Pan? God, I'm embarrassed. I mean, I, I don't really know. I mean... What can I say? Maybe it's because I don't drive. I'm, when I'm do a you walker. drink? Do you I, smoke? Do you no, chase I, women? I, for an Irishman, <laughs> for an Irish person, I, I don't, I've never liked beer. I, I like a glass of wine and stuff. And I'm, I don't know. I, I, I'm not really aware of what it is or how it is. I mean, I try to lead a healthy life in the sense that I love walking. The fact that I don't drive a car uh, helps with that. You know, because I think if you drive, you tend to want to walk everywhere. As you want to drive everywhere, even if it's only a short journey. So I do a lot of walking every day and. Uh, other than that, glass you, don't, of wine. you don't train or run or do anything like uh, that. Not really, not really. I mean, because you are astounded. Listen, t- take this as an unsolicited testimonial. This man looks fresh. I think the modern word is fit. <laughs> um, you're in good nick, Gilbert, <laughs> and and, uh, and nice to see you back in back in Ireland. You have a tour starting. Let's get the plug out of the way first. The tour starts tomorrow, I think, in the Radisson in, in Galway. If I if I read my little list. Uh, and you've got quite a few dates in here. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. And uh, we come back about every two years because it's around every two years I bring out a new album. And and it's just, you know, of course, Irish audiences are the best in the world. I mean, you not only get that from me, but you get people like Bruce Springsteen will tell you that when they do live albums, they're always recorded here. Yeah, but you see, Springsteen does a good show. <coughs> you do a good show. We hope, um, yes. you don't uh, You don't get a second or third bite in Ireland, really, no, that's true. if you do a bad show. Mm-hmm. And some very big acts have come in here. And really, did their no, their reputations no good? I, I'm I'm thinking of, of of even, and I won't mention the name, but I'm thinking of people with international reputations sure. that arrived here, did a bad gig, almost a contemptuous gig. Yeah. Irish audiences don't like that. But you've got a great rep mm. for kind of in a quiet way reaching out to an audience. Is is that is that just cra- stagemanship or craftsmanship? Well, I think that that there's an intimacy between the performer and the audience, which I like to, which I kind of relate to. It's a very one-on-one thing with me. I don't talk a great deal. I mean, I I don't really introduce many songs because I've always felt it's the the Francis Bacon analogy that if you can talk about it, why write it? it, Because if you tell people how about a certain song, it may spoil what it was that they thought it was about. So in a way, I don't I don't speak a great deal on stage, but I, but I have I have a naturalness. I mean, I make mistakes, and what I love about live concerts is that when the, when you make the mistakes, it breaks a lot of ice, and it can be fun and stuff. Well, I, f- I forget words and make mistakes. I mean, it's, that's that's the great thing about live. Nothing is really perfect. Yeah, but there's not a hint of arrogance at all there. In fact, there's a <clears> hint of a vulnerability, which is quite endearing. But let's let's go back, Raymond Edward O'Sullivan. Born on the 1st of December 1946 in Waterford, Ireland. How did you avoid the show band era? Uh, <laughs> I, guess, I guess because I left when, we, when I was seven. And my father worked at Clover Meats and uh, the grass was greener on the other side. So uh, he went over and, and mum followed with us and uh, we settled in Swindon. So my sister liked the show bands more than I am. Mean, the, the, the Royal uh, of Waterford. The, the, Waterford, the Royal Manche, Royal, that, yeah, was, yeah. that was their turf. That's right, and they went to Vegas, and they, they did, Brendan Boyer, they did brilliantly. He, he, actually, Brendan did an album, I think, a CD a few years back. He did a lovely version of Nothing Rhymed and stuff, so there's a kind of link there. You should get a hold of that. It's a really Waterford nice Finn, we'll go looking for that. Um, another surprising thing, this is, you, you know when you get these research briefs, it's great. I'm riffling through these things, and you find all kinds of things, a lot of stuff you already knew. Mm. I hadn't realised you had 50 bouts as a boxer. Yeah, I was... I was. Uh, the nose is still perfect. <laughs> that's why I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Once it started, I heard. I mean, I was a schoolboy with the British Railways Boxing Club in Swindon. And uh, our trainer was an Irishman. Uh, there was a big Irish contingent in Swindon, still is, of course. And uh, so I boxed as a schoolboy and then went to junior stage. Got to the you would be fairly lightweight. I got to the quarterfinals of the All England. And, but I, it, once you become a junior, it starts to hurt. So I, I, that's when I gave it up. But the, your real talent was artistic, and it started off, uh, you went to art college, um, sure. you were painting and drawing, and that won you the place, 
and you you had planned to be a graphic designer. Well, I did illustrate. I did four years at art school, which was a great breeding ground for musicians, as it happens, because there was such freedom in art schools in those days. It's very academic today, but in those days we had such a lot of freedom. So music and art are very closely linked, I think. So I, I did fine art to begin with, and then I went into illustration and graphics. And so I, if I'd have been able to... Do you still dabble a bit? No, I don't have time. You paint? No, I don't have time. It's, uh, everything for me is really revolves around the, the musical. Well, Song, uh, songwriting uh, is such a... Sort well, of at what stage process. did you discover sex and drums and rock and roll? <laughs> sex and drums. Well, I had the drums before... <laughs> <laughs> but because I used to be a drummer and stuff, but that, um, that, that I learned the doodles. <laughs> yeah, my that's, I, you know, in the early sixties, I mean, the groups were springing up everywhere because of the Beatles and stuff. So naturally, uh, I wanted to be in a band and small band and got into a semi-professional band with a member who ended up uh, forming Supertramp. So it got quite serious. But then I decided to to go on my own. But the four years at art school was wonderful for me got encouragement for my songwriting. And, and I, had I gone into the art world for illustration, I would have ended up in a kind of design centre somewhere. I liked illustration, but uh, I don't get time to do it now. The writing, the first song that we're aware of, that we, we know that you wrote, was one called Ready Miss Steady. Yeah, Ready Miss Steady, which I've never recorded. But I, I was going to say, how, do, how does that go? Well, she travels through the cities and the streets on her own, just looking for a fellow who can sit on a throne. To make a fool and idolise whenever she can is all this girl that walks the town can understand. She's ready, Miss Steady, and everyone knows she's ready, Miss Steady, who really goes for her man. So that's a 16-year-old uh, lyricist coming Ro- out. A, a bit of rock and roll, It's a little it? rock and roll song. I sometimes do it live. I've never actually recorded it. Because I'm one of these people that I don't like to go back on things. I like to keep moving forward. So I do have a lot of these songs... And so how I compensate for that is I just do them occasionally live. It's a nice little song, as it happens. So it's sometimes the earliest songs you write. Paul McCartney wrote when I'm 64, when he was a teenager. i tell you what would be of, of great interest to anybody. You see, I have a, song, a son who's a songwriter, and I think a very good one, but I'm his dad. How do you get that first break? How do you make the first contact where somebody important actually hears your work? I think that it, it comes... Part of the process is a healthy arrogance, is to believe in yourself more than anybody else. So even if what you're writing isn't good, if you think it's good, in other words, it, it's, that's the key, because too many talented people go to publishers and go to record companies and ask them, what do you think of this song? What do you think of this? Whereas I had the healthy arrogance of a 19-year-old going to the major record companies in London, CBS, and, and saying to them, I'm good, listen to this and stuff. So I think that helps you. And then you get notice. It's luck and timing that, that gives you the, uh, the, the eventual break. Because to begin with, it's like an apprenticeship. You go to one record company, it all falls apart. You go to another record company, it gets slightly better. Until eventually you meet the person who can guide you through the pitfalls that you've experienced uh, beforehand. They didn't actually let you produce and arrange the first uh, singles that you made, did they? No, I wouldn't have wanted to produce. I worked with a, with a top-of-the-range producer who had, who had had a big success with a number one record in England. So I was working with top people, arrangers and stuff. Now, I was interested in it sounding as good as it could sound. And even though I was very naive and, and, and young, I was very determined how I should sound. But, of course, you, you, do, get, you, know, you do get put into a corner and told, look, you're just starting out, this is how we're going to do it. So you learn from that. And eventually you get a little more say in what's going on. But the, the real key to my success was meeting somebody who could put me, avoid all those kind of pitfalls, somebody who could steer who my was career. That? And that was Gordon Mills. Who, but you and Gordon had a huge falling out at one stage. Oh, look, yeah, we did fall out over the, the right reasons, but it became the wrong reasons in terms of... But you were, you were part of his household at one Very stage. Very much so, part of the family. I looked upon him almost like, a, almost like a father. My own father had died when I was 11. So I almost saw him as a kind of father figure, and I trusted him implicitly. And he was wonderful for my career in the beginning. He managed Tom Jones, yeah, Engelbert Humperdinck. Engelbert, yeah. So he was the best manager for a solo artist. But so you I was were, in good you, company. You were probably the only writer in his stable. Yeah, Gordon did write songs. So, so for example, I didn't want to be a Tom Jones or a Humperdinck. So if you imagine him in his office with his secretary, every day he's getting packages coming through, we would be Humperdinck's, would be Tom Jones's. Suddenly, this little cassette arrived, not cassette, little reel-to-reel message tape arrives with, with my demos on it and this guy is dressed in a Charlie Chaplin jacket and a cap and boots. I mean, 
if there's one person who isn't going to be Tom Jones, it was me. <laughs> and so he threw the, 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 he threw the package in the bin, but his secretary re- retrieved it. And he was intrigued. How could anybody look like that, want to, <laughs> want to write to me? So when he listened to the songs, that was what drew him to me. The songs spoke for the themselves. Songs. I'm going to play one now, and then I want to hear the story about it uh, afterwards. My guest is Gilbert O'Sullivan, um, a prolific writer, and we think of him as Irish, and uh, how do you think of yourself? Well, I'm, my roots are here, so, and so you, can't, you can't throw hey, away your roots. You, you I'm sure proud you of my Irish roots. So. Uh, one, of his, one of his great hits, Get Down, and we, we, I'm going to talk to him about that right after you listen to it. You're tuned to 4FM, this is Davis on 4, and you're listening to Gilbert O'Sullivan. You're listening to Davis on 4. That was Get Down by my special guest this morning, Gilbert O'Sullivan. And now the history of Get Down. When did you write it? At a time was it with knew... the Gordon Mills? Well, yeah, it was... The way the songs always came about was... Oh, yeah. When Gordon signed me, I hadn't written Nothing Rhymed, which was my first success. He just liked those songs that I first played him. And then he wanted to hear more. And then he signed me. And then in the process of the year that he signed me, I eventually came up with what became the first record, which was Nothing Rhymed. And, and things started to move since then. But from then, but but all that ever happens, Derek, is that that Gordon says we're going to be making a record. We need another single, or we need to make an album. And what have you got? No, so I it? would just come up with whatever I got. There was no formula. I was surprised like when you told me that when you sent in the the little reel to reel tape, that there was the photograph. You were already in that what Hovis advertisement yeah, outfit. Yeah, the, the, the Bisto kid, the the, the yeah. Just William. Car- I'd call myself Gilbert. I didn't call myself Gilbert O'Sullivan. I just called myself Gilbert. Where did, that, where did the outfit come from? Well, I used to hire a chaplain jacket from Berman's, the theatrical costumers. I mean, the Beatles are the catalyst for me looking different because when they came out in 62, they didn't have to have Beatle haircuts, they didn't have to have collarless jackets, but they did because they wrote fantastic songs. So they could have been successful without all that. So the, their image left a big imprint on me. So by the time I wanted to be a singer, it was impossible to look different because long hair was here to stay and, and it was the flower power era, late 60s. So I went the other way. I cut my hair really short. I got the Chaplin jacket because I used to go and watch the bus to Keaton Chaplin seasons at the Academy Cinema. So I was very into that and, and I hired the jacket and I had the boots and the, the tie and I really worked hard on it because I, it was a sort of a, a light issue compared to the seriousness of writing songs and I knew that despite how I looked, you had that contradiction about how looking, somebody looking like this could write songs like this. I liked that contradiction. Yeah, and, and you, remain, you remain a little mysterious and that you don't end up in the gossip columns. Um, I ha- I, I'm not aware of your reckless nights with Kate Moss. Or, <laughs> and maybe here, enlighten don't, me. Don't, I wouldn't want my wife to know that if it was true. But uh, I, I'm not a red carpet person. I never was. I mean, uh, there's a lovely story that when I was first successful because I was always very basically shy people say how can you be basically shy you appear in front of thousands of people but after my initial success Paul McCartney gave a big reception in, in London for his uh, second solo album and, and I got invited and uh, I had no girlfriend at the time so, so this is 1971 just after Nothing Rhymed had taken off uh, so it was all new for me. But anyway, the, um, I took my sister. And when we drove to it, um, there was this huge crowd outside because it was a big sort of walkway down to it. And everybody had to go in and there was cameras there. And so I made the, the, the driver go round. So I, after going around 15 times, the driver was going, look, we've got to stop this. This is getting ridiculous. What do you want to do? And my sister's embarrassed. So, I, so what we did was I got the driver to stop and I, and, I, and I dragged my sister in the top of the queue and we pushed our way through at the top of the queue so we didn't have to go up the red carpet thing. So that was always how I am and that's how I am to this day. I don't like the red carpet treatment. I'm not in favour of award ceremonies. I think awards are nice, but I don't like the razzmatazz of it. So I've always been like that. I think I guess it's in my nature. It, it is that strange contradiction: a shy and reserved man in the most public of occupations. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, that's okay. It's easy to deal with that because you do have two. You you become a different person. But you like accolades. I mean, you weren't upset, I'm sure, whenever you have a Novello Award and Songwriter of the Year and so on. No, and I, I was nominated for four Grammys in America, but I didn't want to go. Again, I tried not to go, but Gordon forced me to go. Because 
I'm just not comfortable in You and Gordon eventually mm. fell out over money. No, it wasn't over money. It was over an interest in my songs. The whole issue was that uh, when Gordon ceased to manage me, which was my reason for breaking the relationship, was that he was spending too much time with his gorillas. He had gorillas and tigers, and he was going on safari. So he was spending less time with me, and I'm very ambitious musically, and Gordon produced my records. And so he was spending less time. So I felt that what we should do was he should still continue to manage me, but he should let me be produced by other producers. And he didn't like that idea. So because of that, we, uh, we parted company. But I felt it was very amicable because we shook hands. And I said to him, he had promised me from the word go that he'd give me an interest in my songs, a publishing interest, in other words, a co-ownership. But he said, you can't have it until you establish yourself. Well, I'd established myself by 72, 73, 74, 75. But in 1976, I still hadn't received it. So when we broke up, because I hadn't received it, I said to him, will I still get that interest in my songs? And he said, of course, you go into the company next week and the, the, the MD of the company will, will, will sort it out. I go into the company the following Monday and I was told to F off. <laughs> and so I walked out of the office and I didn't know a lawyer from Adam and I just called Harold Davison, who was a big, a big uh, uh, empresario. Sure was, yeah. His son, I knew his son, Gary. So I said to Gary, can you recommend a, a lawyer for me? So I went into the action only to get the interest in my songs. But like a lot of these things, it, it, a whole can of worms erupts mm -hmm. and it becomes about all other issues. Very sorry. And did, did you take a long time before you went back to writing and recording again? No, I'd always continued to write, but of course it was, it was because of what was going on. You kept it It tended secret. to affect... Well, no, it, it affected my writing in the sense that uh, it's arguable that probably what I was writing lyrically had a lot to do with what was going on. But I never got off the treadmill. I mean, I think it's a very dangerous thing for a performer... Particularly a I got the impression at the time that you'd actually stopped performing. No, I hadn't. I didn't perform. That's correct. I, I uh, not before eighty two, eighty three. I uh, I was prevented to some extent from from releasing records, but I was continuing to write, which is really my main function anyway. I have pages and pages here of credits, things that you've done, um, the uh, the various albums and festivals and so on, and and it's it's an extraordinary CV for a quiet and shy, uh, an artistic man. It, it really is. Um, it's almost, and I, I'm not, when I say schizophrenic, I don't mean it in a, in a pejorative sense. It's almost as if there are two Gilberts. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. The public one and the private one. And the private one is, my last album was called A Scruff at Heart, which is basically what I am. <laughs> I mean, if a knock comes are to you, the are door... Are you in the Channel Islands now? Yeah, I live in Jersey, yeah. That's kind of... I, I know it's, there are tax advantages in that. Absolutely. But the um, same tax You pay your 20%, you, you don't have to buy a forest to save your money on <laughs> uh, those kind of things. But it's also a place, because I have been there, and I know some of the... The, the successful people that live there mm. also cherish their privacy. It's a very kind of private place. Uh, well, I chose it because it, it, it's a good place to raise kids because there's a small population and, and there's no overcrowding in the schools and the schools are fairly normal. So that's important. The tax advantage means that you pay a 20% and that's the end of it. So you don't have to think about any other aspect of, of uh, tax avoidance. But do you rub shoulders with Alan Wicker no, I don't, and no, the I, well, Twins? I, and my wife is, I've met him at the airport and, and my wife has met him a few times because I don't socialise. I'm very antisocial <laughs> in, in a nice way. My wife now, the nice thing about Jersey for my wife is that because it's a small island, everybody knows each other. So she goes to receptions. They all think she has a husband who's left her. I mean, because she's, <laughs> she's, she's, never, she's never seen with her husband and stuff. But, uh, but, but Jersey is, is nice for me. And, and, and because of the hermit-like existence of a lyricist in me. You mentioned the children. Yeah. Um, how many? I have two girls. Two girls. And, and uh, their names? Helen Marie and Tara. Tara was born in Bunclody, so Well, she was born in No, Dublin. Claire. Well, Claire was, my, was Gordon's daughter, and, um, uh. and the song was written for the parents about her. I uh. used to babysit for them. I mean, uh, you know, going back to what we said earlier about being, being close to the family, I, used, yeah. I lived down the road. I'd walk up to their house. Joe, his wife, would cook for me. And they would go to Big Some Do and they would ask me to babysit for them. So Claire was the one always kind of getting up in the middle of the night. And I love children because I have come you, from a large family. She'd be full-grown woman now. We did the Albert Hall uh, in last October, a very special concert, first time, and uh, invited her and her mother and the other uh, Gordon Mills children. They all came. It was a wonderful, wonderful evening. Oh, that's good. That's good. What, what, what age are your own children? Uh, they're... Helen-Marie is 20, yeah. 20, uh, Tara is 26 and, and Helen-Marie is 29. Uh, uh, full they, grown. Are they, they're not still at home? No, they both live in London. They're, they're, they're London girls. They, uh, one of them, Helen-Marie, the old, eldest, works at EMI Music Publishing, so she's a backroom person. 
And Tara is, uh, she works for a PR firm. So they're happy girls. So, And, and uh, you're happy with your life? I, I, I enjoy what I do, Derek, because I love, I mean, the whole thing for me is writing songs. I think if I couldn't write songs, it's the songs that lead to me talking to you. It's the songs that lead to me doing concerts and stuff. And, and there's a great joy in songwriting. And you're always learning. So even though I've been writing now for almost 50 years, I'm still learning. You know uh, the old line, don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Yeah, I agree with it. Um, when you see your daughters <laughs> kind of veering in that direction... No, they're not veering in that direction. They're way off it. Don't, don't worry. They're never going to be on the, the forefront. I don't like... I mean, there are many examples. Carol King's daughter tried it, uh, Louise Goffin. Uh, she didn't happen. Jacob Dylan, Bob Dylan's son, has tried it. And Sting's daughter is the latest. Sinatra's daughter. Nancy. Well, Nancy yeah. was different, I yeah. think. She didn't want to emulate her father, and uh, she got away. She did well. Julian Lennon? Yeah, but it, it, it hit him in the end. It, it, he couldn't yeah. sustain it. Yeah. And the legacy of his father was too large. Uh, Paul McCartney's son has just gone out on the road. James McCartney. He's just gone out doing small shows. And but I, I, I always prayed the girls wouldn't... I, I couldn't stop them. But fortunately, they... Uh, they're not uh, interested in being in performers. God, thank God. What are you working on at the moment? You've got... I have a new album now, which is coming yeah. out soon, and uh, we're, I've just finished, we've just finished mixing it. So that will be coming out around April, May time. And then the RT have a documentary on me coming out in April, which is very interesting because they followed me around for the last two years to Nashville, to Israel, to the Albert Hall. So God, that should need, be interesting. You need deep pockets to do that kind of documentary. Well, they did it. Adrian, <laughs> Adrian McCarthy is a very good director and uh, I was very reluctant at first to allow somebody to get that close to me. But he's very good because he's, he keeps in the background. So I, I, I'm, to all intents and purposes, I heard it's very good. because I, I We have a song here called All They Wanted. All They Wanted to Say, yeah. Yeah. Is that off the new album? Or? That's correct, yeah. And, and we have a sneak. It's kind of is this a kind of a sneak preview of the album, or is it? Yeah. Have you released in, this? As yeah, a in a way, because it's it, it that will be on the album. It may well be a single in in, in in due course. All right, just some some dates to note. If you're in the Galway area tomorrow, uh, on the fifteenth, you'll find Gilbert in the Radisson Hotel. He's moving on to Drogheda after that, then Wexford, Killarney, Cork, Limerick, and three Dublin dates in the Grand Canal Theatre. Uh, and a little note says tickets on sale now. Gilbert O'Sullivan, thank you for Brilliant, coming Danny. in. Nice talking to you. I and you too, because, you, as I say, I had grown up watching you uh, on television, listening to you on the radio, and to a certain extent you remain an enigma, but I'm glad to meet the man and know a little <laughs> bit more about him. Um, this is the sneak preview. <laughs>